The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. And now the word of the Lord as it is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful ways, un underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is uh, veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> as we come now to this short session, we do pray that you would guard us from our natural inclination to disgraceful ways, underhanded ways, cunning ways, tampering ways. Oh, Lord, may this time be nothing more and nothing less than an open statement of the truth. Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray this in his holy name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. In 1811, Thomas Chalmers, slowly recovering from an illness that for more than eight months he thought might take his life, came to this passage of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. In his diary, he wrote, the Spirit provoked me to read this over and over again. And then, very briefly, he simply said, Herein is a stinging rebuke and indictment to all heretofore marking my calling and comprehension of ministry. Here in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is, of course, dealing with a recalcitrant church, a troubled church. It was divided. It was fractious. It was filled with doctrinal error and moral failure. It was filled with troubled marriages, gender confusion. It was filled with parties that were divided against each other and now were divided against the Apostle Paul. They had chaotic worship, and church discipline had broken down, and it made the church very feeble indeed. Paul, fielding one complaint after another about his character, about his honesty, about the intentions that he had for ministry, about the fact that he was unimpressive in person, though he wrote stern letters, says to them that he has no intention whatsoever of defending himself, verse 5. He's not here to preach himself, defend himself, to say anything about himself. His only job is to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. He says that, in verse 1, he's received this ministry 
by the mercy of God. From the beginning of the letter, he reminds them that he's an apostle by the will of God, chapter 1, verse 1, that, that he is, in fact, appointed by him, anointed by him, sent by him, called by him, established by him, made a witness by him. And so in a sense, what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is, look, if you've got a beef against this ministry, your beef is with God, not with me. And then he makes this really remarkable statement. He says, I therefore do not lose heart. Despite all of the trouble in the church, I do not lose heart. I don't lose heart because I know that the fruit that will ultimately be borne by the ministry in Corinth is not dependent upon me. It's not dependent upon my competency. It's not dependent upon my cunning. It's not dependent upon my calling. It's dependent upon the work of the Lord and the work of the Lord alone. And then he says... And in case you're thinking that I'm going to change my ways, I've got news for you. He says, I have renounced four things. And he names them. Disgraceful ways, underhanded ways, the practice of cunning and tampering with the word. He uses really strong language here. He he says renounce. It's literally, I forbid, or I command away these four things. Disgraceful ways, literally worldly ways, sensate ways, the appeal to the flesh. If you think that I'm going to preach to your felt needs... (laughs) Forget about it. I command away disgraceful ways. Secondly, he says, I I command away underhanded ways. Literally, sleight of hand, trickery. Now, this is a a, a phrase that is often used in classical Greek to, uh, uh, to describe an emotional appeal. Stirring up of passions, getting people worked up. Preacher, get me going! Paul says, sorry, no. He commands away underhanded ways. Third, he says, he commands away the practice of cunning. Literally, the practice of that which is slick. But that which is... uh, fine-tuned to a particular kind of technique, either rhetorical or theatrical. Paul says, no theater here. I command away the practice of cunning. And fourth, he says, I command away tampering with the word. Literally toying with the word, fiddling with the word, using the word as a springboard to get to what I really want to talk about. Seven ways that you can be the best you you can be. Paul says instead, this whole ministry is going to rely on this. An open statement of the truth. That the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, might be displayed. And that light might shine out of darkness. Paul simply saying, hear what he said to his disciple Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What more do you want? Paul came across the recalcitrance of the Corinthian church, and then his words came across the recalcitrance of a Scottish preacher 
in a country church in Kilmeny, Fifeshire, and it changed everything. Some men's greatness may be seen in how largely they loom over the movements that they launched. These are the Nebuchadnezzars and the Napoleons, the Caesars and the Charlemagnes. But greater men are they whose movements loom large over them, even to the point of obscuring them from view. According to Andrew, uh, excuse me, Ian Murray, when Thomas Chalmers was born in 1780, it was about the deadest time in the history of the Church of Scotland since the Reformation. But when he died in 1847, it was about the alivest. And the difference was almost entirely attributable to the Spirit's work through him. Thomas Chalmers would become the undisputed leader of a vibrant evangelical resurgence over the course of 40 years of ministry, he would serve as a pastor, professor, and publisher. He would plant churches, wayside chapels, and chapels of ease. He would establish schools and missions, organizations, and Bible societies. He would write books on a myriad of subjects from economics and social policy to moral and natural philosophy and he would write beautiful devotions and commentaries. He would lead an unprecedented church planting movement, and he would mentor an entire generation of theologians and pastors and educators and missionaries and writers and thinkers and scientists and artists and musicians and politicians and reformers and architects. James Cochran said he was of the rare order of men who draw to themselves by some magnetic power youths flocking from afar from the very ends of the earth, identifying them with truth and progress, which elicited from them their fondest regard in return and a transformed culture as a result. Indeed, W.M. Taylor observed, to the end of his days, he around, had around him a circle of loving and devoted disciples, all of whom were fired with enthusiasm, which they had caught from his lips. He was not so much an instructor or a teacher or a pastor as a quickener. Others laid materials in the minds of their hearers. But he brought and struck the match, which kindled those materials into a flame that burned with an energy kindred to his own. His disciples proved to be a veritable galaxy of brilliant Reformed Scots preachers, writers, and missionaries, including Robert Murray McShane and William Chalmers Burns and John Milne and Alexander Moody Stewart and John Urquhart and Robert Nesbitt and Alexander Somerville and Rabbi John Duncan and Alexander Duff and uh, William Sinclair uh, McKay and the Bonar brothers, James, uh, John, Andrew, and Horatius, and even William Chal Walter Chalmers Smith, whose hymn we just sang, and the story of which I'll tell you in a little bit. Emphasizing the pursuit of sanctification and a passion for evangelism, both at home and abroad on the mission field, Together, all of these disciples came to be known variously as the evangelical prodigies, the St. Andrew's savants, the school of the saints, and the Chalmers bichons. Indeed, they would be responsible for an astonishing burst of gospel energy, productivity, and profundity 
hardly ever matched before or since. C.H. Waller claimed, the nearest approach that I know of in the history of the church universal to apostolic conditions of faith and living was what was to be found in the Free Church of Scotland in its early days under the stewardship of Thomas Chalmers. A generation later, Kelton McPhee would exclaim, Scotland is now filled with men, and England more than a few of such, who never weary in giving utterance to their feelings when they speak of those happy times of excitement when they spent days in the presence of Dr. Chalmers while the great man himself held the mind and the soul of all present in his powerful grasp Inasmuch as he sent forth over its surface a body of men who, if they will not turn aside from the path that he sent them forward, may, with God's help, bring about the Christian regeneration of Scotland and a resurgence of faith around the world. For now every parish has a young want-to-be, would-be Chalmers. It's astonishing, though, isn't it, that he is so little known today. Jonathan Master has said Thomas Chalmers was a colossal figure who deserves to be more widely known and studied today. Sandy Finlayson, a recent biographer, has said he was that rare breed of scholar, teacher, pastor, and public theologian. Thomas Carlyle called him the chief Scottish man. He was a friend of William Wilberforce. He was the close confidant and discipler of Merle Daubigny. He was a close yoke fellow with Andrew Fuller, with Charles Simeon, with William Taylor Coleridge, with William Gladstone and Sir Walter Scott. Yet he is hardly known today. He was a stunningly brilliant mind, a mesmerizing orator, a tireless organizer, and impossibly productive in all of the details of his life for the 67 years of his life. So why is he not well known today? Why is he not an exemplar for us? Well, I'm convinced that it is simply because everything he stood for stands in contradistinction to everything that we're about in our day in the modern church. Carl Truman has said Thomas Chalmers was a colossus of such stature that even Karl Marx felt the need to name and shame him in Das Kapital. (laughs) He was a scholar, Truman says, a philosopher, an economist, but above all else, he was a churchman. And because, above all else, he was a churchman, he's fallen out of favor in our day. Evidence of his churchmanship abounds in uh, the myriad of his endeavors. And uh, I don't have uh, the time or the space uh, to detail them all. We could spend a lot of time just on the life of Chalmers and his biography, his precocious youth. Born in 1780, by the age of three, he was already enrolled in the parish school. By the age of 11, he was at the University of St. Andrews. By the age of 15, he had been enrolled in the theological curriculum. By the age of 19, he was already licensed to preach, even though the Church of Scotland had a rule that you had to be 21 except in exceptional cases. By the age of 20, he was ordained. By the time he was 23, he was a pastor. 
His early ministry was marked by an uh, immense ambition and great erudition. In 1803, he came to Kilmeny, and in all that time, though raised in a faithful, godly home, though properly catechized, educated, and nurtured all along the way, he did not know Christ. But in 1811, following a series of setbacks, three of his siblings, he was the sixth of 14 children in his family, three of his siblings died of consumption. He sat at the bedside of two of his siblings, a sister and a brother, and was required by them to read the sermons of John Newton, though he had always despised them. And sing the psalms as they lay dying. And then he himself that was afflicted with consumption and assumed that he too would die. Long fascinated with mathematics, he came to realize that he had lost sight of the two great magnitudes. The littleness of time and the greatness of eternity. As he began to recover, he found that he had an insatiable appetite for the word of God. And he began to pray like he had never before, study like he had never before. He went back and he refreshed his Greek and his Hebrew. And when he was able to return to the pulpit at the end of the year in 1811, It was marked by everyone, this is a changed man. Almost immediately, crowds began to crowd around the church, in the church. Little chapel at Kilmany, which still stands, holds maybe 60 people. The average attendance from 1812 to 1815 at that little chapel which still only had one service, was somewhere between 250 and 350 souls. They knocked out the windows. They built platforms outside. And you know how wonderful Scottish weather can be. (laughs) This man was on fire. His fame began to spread all around. He began to uh, receive calls to larger pulpits in London, in Stirling, in Edinburgh. And finally in 1815, he... He began to believe that if the Church of Scotland, which then was in the grips of moderatism, their name in those days for a cold and sedate liberalism, if there was any hope at all for the Church of Scotland, uh, then uh, what he needed to do was bring the beauty and the goodness and the truth of the ordinary means of grace ministry that he had seen grow in Little Kilmeny, with its Bible societies and its foreign missions emphasis, if he could bring that to a city like Glasgow, then at the hub of the spinning wheel of the Industrial Revolution, if he could do that, then, oh, what a great kingdom work that would be. And so in 1815, he accepted a call to go to the Tron Church, the most influential church in all of Scotland, and became their pastor. In 1819, pursuing his vision of of church planting and church extension, he planted a new parish in Glasgow, St. John's, and In 1823, he moved on to teach students to do what he had done at Tron and St. John's. And then in 1828, moved on again to the University of Edinburgh, where almost immediately he was dragged into a life and death fight for the Church of Scotland. Between 1834 and 1843, a period known as the Ten Years' Conflict. He fought for the integrity of the church. He fought for the polity of the church. He fought for its purity and its peace. But at the General Assembly of 1843, recognizing that all further recourse was closed, 
he led almost 500 teaching and ruling elders out of the Church of Scotland and every single one of its foreign missionaries and every single one of its seminary students to form the Free Church of Scotland. But that's not really the story that I want to tell you today. I want you to see his churchmanship. He was a great leader. He was a great orator. He had the ability to, uh, uh, to rally people to grand causes, but it was his churchmanship that marked him out in his day, and it is his churchmanship that in our day we most need but least see. We see the churchmanship of Chalmers first in his unswerving commitment to the ordinary means of grace, words, sacrament, and prayer, what that John Payne was talking about in the last session. It was his commitment to uh, the scriptures, N- knowing that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, that marked his ministry from 1811 all the way to his death in 1847. He said, the Spirit guides us into all truth, and all truth is to be found in the Bible. Therefore, the Spirit guides us unto the Bible. He said, but we have to make the Bible our vade mecum, our book of reference, our book of trust. And let us be more and more convinced of the prodigious fertility of the Bible. How much lies hidden and unobserved, even after many perusals, even after many preachings. And surely, if it be true that a man may read it a hundred times and find something on his next reading which he missed, and all the former ones, oftener recourse to this means of grace bids fair for multiplying our blessings. Therefore, let us be quick to be in the way of grace. It was a phrase that he repeated over and over again. He would greet his disciples on the street and he would say, are you quick in the way of grace, my brother? Wait not for the afflatus. He believed in gospel proclamation and the necessity of the gospel bringing uh, men to the place of conviction about their sin and their need for Christ. He warned a group of his students, we must stand against the diseased touchiness of our age which dislikes urgent preaching, the preaching of repentance. I love that phrase, diseased touchiness. I know those guys, do you? He said, the Holy Spirit's office as defined by the Bible itself is not to make known to us any of the truths which are not contained in the Bible, but to make clear to our understandings the truths which are contained in it. He opens our understandings to understand the scriptures. The word of God is called the sword of the spirit. It is the instrument by which the spirit worketh. He does not tell us anything that is out of the record, but all that is within it, he sends home with clearness and effect upon the mind. And all that is outside of it is shaped and shaded by all that is in it, so that this is the ground we stand on, this and no other. After 1811, his preaching came alive because the word of God was alive in him. And he wanted the word of God to go forth among the people. He wanted the joy of the Lord to be their strength. He wanted the expulsive power of a new affection to push every other concern and every other interest to the margins. He yearned for the Christian good of Scotland and the world. He was committed unswervingly to the ordinary means of grace. 
Second, we see the churchmanship of Chalmers in his determined recovery of pastoral care. He came again and again in his own devotions and in his lectures to John chapter 21. Jesus, post-resurrection, comes to his disciples, speaking to Peter, says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Tend my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I do. Then feed my sheep. He wrote, the care for the souls of men does not end in the pulpit. It begins there. It has its sumum there. But we must take the gospel to the people. The unchurched must not be left alone. Rather, they must be graciously pursued wherever they are to be found. May we be the hounds of heaven in the hot pursuit of every soul in our neighborhood. When he first came to the Tron Church in Glasgow, this big, prominent church where... All of the pew rents were rented, 1,300 souls. But in a parish with 11,000 souls, there were only eight elders and no deacons. The elders were all older men who basically gathered once a month to discuss the finances of the parish. Chalmers realized this is not the way to reach our community. So immediately he began to look for men who might be capable of being officers of the church. He spent six months training them and equipping them. And then uh, dividing up the parish into apportionments, he began to send them out. 25 different apportionments, uh, an elder for every one, accompanied by a deacon in every one. And their job was to examine the hearts and the souls of every household, of every man, of every woman, of every child, and bring them the hope of the good news of the gospel. Discern any needs that they might have and find ways of bringing all of the means of grace to them. Chalmers wrote, Now in our large towns we have the ministerial service without the pastoral. And we all know what a loose and precarious connection between ministers and uh, people uh, this has given rise to. It forms a most imperfect spiritual husbandry, uh, just as much so as if in natural husbandry, the whole of agriculture were confined to the merely casting of seeds upon the ground without the preparation of the soil before, uh, without any inquiry about the care of the progress of the vegetation afterwards. Although the rains of the heavens, which might easily have been drained off, should destroy the rising crop, or fowls of the air, which might have easily scared, uh, been scared away, should devour it, the scanty and uncertain produce from such mere scatterings as these will represent the scanty and uncertain produce of all of our city sermons. This is why he said, a spiritual map of Glasgow looks like the pox. He said, there is not a city population that will not that will not rapidly degenerate under the regimen of well-served pulpits and ill-served parishes. And so he told his elders, go meet the people, find the people, love the people, serve the people, know the people. One of his charges that every time they went out for visitation was, brothers, look in their eyes, discern the truth, and know the relationships, love them well with the power of the gospel. Third, <clears throat> third we see the churchmanship of Thomas Chalmers in the revival and the renewal of the office of deacon. It wasn't just elders going forth. It was the deacons who had the responsibility uh, to find physical needs 
and find ways to biblically meet them. Chalmers was ardently opposed to the poor law system, uh, the early system of public welfare. During the time of the Industrial Revolution, the cities, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, were crowded with the poor. Tenement housing grew up in places like Westport, but where the people were crowded together, they had no access to the means of grace. There were no churches that served them. And so Chalmers determined uh, that he would send men to identify needs, create a beachhead of the gospel in those homes in order to bring them to Christ. He wrote, a single human being called out of darkness, though he lived in some putrid lane or unheard of obscurity, is a brighter testimony than all of the applause of the fashionable. Let the church be the church, he said. Fourth, we see the churchmanship of Chalmers in the sacrificial commitment that he made to church planting and to church extension. In those days, the Church of Scotland were, was uh, very regimented about how uh, churches could be planted and where they would be planted. Uh, the truth is, is that in the 19th century, uh, most of the parishes wanted to protect their boundaries and protect the flow of income into their churches, uh, which were pooled between all of the churches in the presbytery. And so there was great resistance to the idea of church planting. One of the things that Chalmers did was almost immediately he began to establish in the poorest sections of uh, the city chapels of ease or wayside chapels. These were places where uh, deacons and elders could gather, uh, where the pastors could preach. Uh, they weren't churches per se, and they weren't sites for a multi-site system. But they were instead beachheads of the gospel. He said, if the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth, it is then our highest priority in the proclamation of the gospel, in the extension of God's kingdom, in the Christianization of culture, the establishing of churches in every community, large and small, let none be neglected. All our people need the means of grace, he wrote. Fifth, uh, we see the churchmanship of Thomas Chalmers and the determination to establish parish schools, particularly among the poorest of the poor. Almost immediately upon arriving in Glasgow, he established two neighborhood schools and 40 neighborhood schools. Sabbath schools. When he went to St. John's, within two years, they had established two neighborhood schools and dozens of Sabbath schools. Sandy Finlayson says, that Chalmers was by no means the first to tap into the power of Sunday schools, but his notion was far more radical it wasn't simply to teach moralistic lessons. It was to bring the gospel. It was to be a beachhead of the kingdom. It was to bring about cultural renewal through the application of evangelism, discipleship, and the transformation of sanctification over the course of time. Sixth, we see the churchmanship of Thomas Chalmers in his commitment to foreign missions and the engagement of local churches in the interest of missions. In the 19th century, the whole idea of the missions movement was rather new, and Chalmers was at the forefront, calling his students to consider going to far fields in India and China and beyond, and calling all churches, rich and poor, to be engaged and invested in foreign missions. He came up with a scheme he called the penny subscription. He believed that even the poorest of the poor could afford a penny a week. 
So he set up this subscription system that literally raised hundreds of millions of dollars in contemporary terms for foreign missions. Remember the first time that I went to northern Iraq, uh, to the great oil-producing city of Kirkuk, for a conference that would bring together Christians from all over Iraq. The two pastors that from Baghdad came, their churches excommunicated each other in 326 over a disagreement over the Nicene Creed. And... Uh, that they met for the first time at this conference in Kirkuk and embraced. It's an astonishing conference. Uh, but the conference was held in a little Presbyterian church. We that drove through the streets of Kirkuk like a, a cavalcade of uh, suburbans. It looked like something out of a Tom Clancy film. And we pulled into this walled compound, and as we made our way into the little parking uh, courtyard, I looked up and there was this little stone Scottish chapel. And I thought to myself, what on earth is that doing here? Looks like no other architecture anywhere around. And I go up and there's a plaque on the wall and Chalmers Chapel was dedicated in 1848 by two of his students who had heeded his call to go to the ends of the earth. He believed that the conclusion of Matthew's gospel was great, he said, because its promises to change us as much as the promises to change the world are right and good and true, and the world as much as us. Seventh, we see the churchmanship of Thomas Chalmers in his ardent promotion of Bible societies. He believed that everyone should have access to the word of God. He said, you must not forget that though doubted, decried, and disowned, the Bible is the word of God with power to recall a lost world from its state of exile and degeneracy and to dethrone sin from its ascendancy. Let us do all that we can to put a Bible in the hands of every soul in Scotland. They instituted a penny subscription plan for Bible distribution. And as a result, he was at the forefront of the Bible society movement. Eighth, we see the churchmanship of Chalmers in his consistent engagement in evangelism and apologetics. When he arrived in the city of Glasgow, uh, there was this uh, habit uh, that uh, once a month, uh, pastors from the city would uh, give lunchtime lectures on Thursday afternoons. These were poorly attended and poorly prepared for, but Chalmers threw himself into it. He saw this as an opportunity to reach the businessmen of the community. He announced a month ahead of time what the topic of his discourses would be. He would examine modern astronomy. Glasgow had never heard of anything like this. Then as a result, the uh, the church was crowded on that first day in 1816. He said, if possible, let us bring over to the humility of the gospel those who would expatate with delight in the wonders and the sublimities of creation and convince them that there is a theme that has a loftier wisdom still than even their high and honorable Acquirements. So he lectured on the question of immensity from Psalm 8, on implausibility from Psalm 113, on imminency from Luke 15, from effectuality in Ezekiel 33, from on the subject of excogition on 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, exclusivity from 1 Peter chapter 1, and insignificance from Galatians chapter 2. It was masterful. He used every conceivable technique of apologetics. There was presuppositionalism, there was evidentialism, there was perspectivalism, there was historism. All thrown together. His vision was, uh, by any means, by every means, beckon every man to Christ. At the end of the lectures, the book was published. It became the best-selling book in the English language from any author outselling Sir Walter Scott and Jane Austen combined for two years. <laughs> he believed that we needed to reach our world. At night, uh, we see the churchmanship of Thomas Chalmers in his commitment to preserve the purity and the peace of the church Regardless of how long the battle, no, no matter how costly it might be, maintaining the integrity of the polity of the church. The 10 years conflict broke his heart. The disruption of the church shattered his dreams. But after the men walked out of the General Assembly and reassembled and elected Chalmers as their moderator, his first words were, Brothers, I do not lose heart. And he concluded declaring, No matter how large, our vision is too small. In the less than five years that remained in his life, Thomas Chalmers was able to see to the planting of more than 400 new churches, more than 500 new parish schools, a new theological training center and college, New College Edinburgh, the erection of a magnificent William Playfair building right on the edge of the Castle Mount, the overlooking the Princess Gardens. In the less than five years that remained of his life, he gave himself heart and soul to the preservation of the purity and the peace of the church I don't have his endurance. I don't have his brilliance. I don't have his eloquence. But I will tell you this. I and others must and shall stand for the integrity of the church in our day, come what may. We'll walk in the footsteps of Chalmers. Tenth. We see the churchmanship of... Chalmers, in his commitment to the training of the next generation of leaders. It's part of the reason why I love Greenville Seminary so much. It's so Chalmers-like. And not just the filling minds and equipping with skills, but, but striking the match and lighting the tinder and setting ablaze at young men for the proclamation of the gospel by the ordinary means of grace. Walter Chalmers Smith was one of those disciples. Obviously, he was named for Chalmers by his parents. By the time he got to New College to study for preparation for the ministry, uh, Chalmers would only live for one more year. So he only had Chalmers as a professor for one year. But that one year left an indelible mark upon him. After completing his theological studies, he was brought to London where he became a pastor of a Scots Presbyterian church in that thriving city. And 25 years later, he was called to the Free High Church in Edinburgh. 
1876. Being back in Edinburgh evoked all kinds of memories for him, and, and so he decided to call together a reunion of sorts, a dinner of his fellow students to reminisce about their days and to plot a path forward in the already troubled Free Church of Scotland. They gathered together for a a, a meal there in Edinburgh at one of the famous inns on the Royal Mile. And they began to reminisce over their meal. Several of the men said, well, the thing that they remember most about Chalmers was the way the man prayed. He prayed with intimacy. He prayed with power. He prayed with the conviction. And they began to recall some of their favorite phrases that Chalmers used when he prayed. It was lofty language always. And Walter Chalmers Smith, after a few minutes of this, realized this was gold. And he started writing down the phrases that each of the men was recalling. This is the way Chalmers would pray. Oh, do you remember that day? It was shortly uh, before our graduation in May when he said this. And, uh, do you remember that snowy day in Edinburgh as we looked out from New College uh, down across the hill? Uh, do you remember what he said? When he went home, Walter Chalmers Smith began to pull all of those phrases together. This is what he came up with. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting. Silent as night. What a legacy. You were singing Chalmers and didn't even know it. We are his heirs. We are his disciples. We are called in this day of disintegrating forces, of an unraveling culture, of a directionless church to be light in darkness and to proclaim from the ordinary means of grace a pathway not just forward, not just upward, but into the midst of the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, and the light that has shined and brings hope to every human heart. My prayer is God give us Chalmers like men again. And start here. Start now and send us out to change the world. Let's pray. Oh, Father, may it be so that you would once again gift the church of Jesus Christ with such servants. We declare you are immortal, invisible. You are God only wise. In your good providence, you have chosen us for this day, for this time. Raise up, O God, a voice of clarity. Enable us to somehow, some way, resist the lure of disgraceful, disreputable tampering, cunning ways and merely proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.